Hi, Misha here, and it seemed a good time for another gun and model video. And in both categories, I've always been a big fan of British stuff, guns and aircraft models. So I brought out a couple of each. This is just a, kind of a general overview, just for fun. We do have full videos on the guns on this channel, talking more about the history. And on my personal channel over at Misha, I have a couple of videos on the planes. So I brought out the good old Enfield number two, Mark I Star, the double action only, spurless hammer version, and 38-200, or 38 Smith & Wesson. And it's kind of counterpart, or rival, the Webley and Scott, Mark IV, also chambered for 38200 and these are both your typical British top brake design. Six shot, this is single double action, and the infield as I said is just double action only, but still a top brake. And to go along with them, I brought out two models of the Gloucester Meteor. I have the original F1 here from World War II. And I have the kind of reconnaissance version, the F9 from the Korean period. Both of these models are 172 scale die cast from Corgi Aviation Archive. So yeah. The story of the revolvers really begins, well, it's kind of contested. In fact, there was a lawsuit from this company, Webley and Scott, about a list gun here, the infield. This was developed or marketed from a government factory, the Royal Small Arms Factory at Enfield. Now what happened originally, after World War I, Webley and Scott made a 38 version. Prior to that, the revolvers were in 455. The reason they went to 38, it was more, it, they realized this was more of a defensive gun. Um, 38 was easier for novices to shoot accurately. The ammo was lighter recoiling and also lighter to carry and allowed the guns themselves to be smaller and lighter. And really they started with the Mark III which they marketed towards police. The Mark IV would be more the militarized version. And the military didn't adopt this. Instead they claimed to come up with the infield on their own and Webley and Scott sued them. Eventually, it was basically found that this was more or less de developed independently. Mm -hmm. But uh, later on, some damages were awarded. Long story short, both ended up being service guns, not only in World War II, but Korea. The infield, the number two, was the official standard issue. Originally, the number two, Mark I, would be double action, single action and with wood grips. Then they would go to the Mark I Star, which would have the DAO trigger and the Bakelite type grips, at least most of them. I picked this for the video because this was often carried more by vehicle drivers, tank crews, and aircraft crews, although not officially. But because Britain needed as many guns as it could get in that war, they ended up adopting the Webley and Scott Mark IV as a substitute standard, purchasing basically nearly as many. And even though both guns pretty much went out of production in the 40s, both would serve on well into the 50s all the way through Korea. And while they would be good old cats, well, they would be supplemented by the high power. They would really hang on 
to their revolvers in one capacity or another until the late 50s. <laughs> And then, of course, once they adopted the high power, they stuck with it for half a century until finally replacing it with the Glock. But it's interesting that they had a 38 caliber revolver in World War II, a time when most other powers were using automatics, but I guess they felt it served their needs. So very traditional there. But when it came to the fighter here, this was pretty advanced. The Meteor was actually the only operational jet fighter that the Allies had during World War II. As you know, the Germans had the Messerschmitt ME 262, also the HE 162, and America did have the P 80, but it really never was in full service before the end of the war. The Meteor was the brainchild of Sir Whittle who partnered with Gloucester in 1939. They had some kind of concept prototypes and whatnot in 1940 and 41. The first true Meteor prototype was in 1943 when it flew. And then by January of 1944, it was operationally ready and put into full production. First deliveries were to the RAF in May. He's gonna keep doing that. And it was first declared combat ready and sent out on its first missions in July of 1944. And its earliest missions were intercepting the buzz bomb, the V-1, essentially cruise missile. And it had some early victories in August with the V-1s. But because this was considered such an important piece of technology, these were kept originally on the home islands there kind of as airfield defense, as the Allies would march through Europe after D-Day, they would start stationing more and more meteors. They would first get into Europe in January of 1945, and then be seen in strength in March. While these never really went head to head with the ME-262 for various historical reasons, they did shoot down and, you know, a number of German fighters, even though they came quite late in the war. The Mark I, or excuse me, the F1, or the F Mark I, if you will, was the first version. It was quickly replaced by the F3, but in any case, it had four 20 millimeter cannon, top speed about 600 miles per hour, it had two jet engines. It um, really was in most ways inferior to the ME-262, but it did have a few aspects over it, more in the reliability department. And also, British, the British engineers really had the metallurgy for the engines and the access to the metals needed, whereas the Messerschmitt engineers did not. Either way, and you can see it's a very conventional wing design. After the war, they would work with the F-4 and then they would test the F-8, putting it into service in 1949. And the F-8 would pretty much be the mainstay of the RAF between that time and 1955, so very much used in the Korean War. And quite a few improvements, although it was still basically the same plane as you see with this F-9 reconnaissance version here. Mostly due to stability, better speed, and they were able to carry bombs or rockets. But of course, by, well, by you know, the Korean War, it was a pretty dated aircraft. Nevertheless, they kept on using it in Britain, much like these revolvers through the late 50s. They were also quite a popular export to allied countries. Uh, they would produce over 3,900 of these. So not an insignificant number. And it was definitely a great step forward in aviation technology. And really, during that first generation of jets, Britain led the way and America followed. It wouldn't be until the F-86 when America would really go past Britain's technology. And a lot of that had to do with politics, how the development had kind of stalled out in that nation. But anyway, I like these die-cast models. Corgi does a really good job with their British ones. This is an older one 
here. It um, comes just with wheels permanently down, although they do roll. It does have a pilot. Newer models, and I say newer quite loosely because even these are several years old, have the option of gear up or down. And pilot. They're very much metal. And pretty, pretty accurate. They do F3s and F8s of several stripes. They also do this plane's competition, the de Havilland Vampire, which is a neat plane. Yeah, there's a certain design aesthetic to British stuff that I really like. It has a certain sensibility to it. And this is a gun I've had for a very long time, about 20 years is one of I think this might have been my very first revolver that I bought. And I remember I bought it in a snowstorm, or at least we were going to the gun shop to pick it up and it was threatening to get worse. It was snowing and barely made it there and got it on time. Very cold day. And this one I picked up off a friend about 10 years ago. I've had a few different Mark IVs over the years. It has the war finish, which is kind of neat. But yeah, if you'd like to know more about these, you can check out our Commonwealth playlist. We have a few videos. And if you're interested in aviation or just models, you can check out my channel, my private channel, Misha, where I do have quite a few Commonwealth models over there too. And if you have any comments, we'd love to chat below about really anything. We appreciate you tuning in. As always, if you could, like, share, and subscribe. And if you'd like to help support the channel, help us get to the range and all that good stuff, please check out the link to our Patreon page. This is Misha, and we will catch you very soon next time.